Well, this morning we're going to continue the series that we started last week on Noah. And it's kind of interesting to me that um, we have a storm approaching. So Hurricane Isaac, well, it's not a hurricane yet, but by tonight it'll be a hurricane in the Gulf of Mexico, will, is projected to come up through Alabama. And we have no idea what that's going to do to us, but we can expect lots of wind and lots of rain. And uh, it's kind of interesting. Next week's sermon is entitled Surviving the Storm. I chose that title a long time ago before I knew anything about the hurricane coming. So, uh, whew, a little interesting. But uh, even though we're expected to get a storm sometime this week, I, I doubt that it would have any comparison to what happened thousands of years ago when God flooded the world because of sin and wickedness. Now, last week... We took a look at Noah and we talked about his life. And we talked about his righteousness. How is it that God extends favor to one man on the earth? When all the earth is filled with corruption, there was one man who was righteous. And that one man was Noah. And, and the Bible says that Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. So it's an amazing thing that God granted favor to this one man. And we talked about how do we get favor from God? How can we have the favor of God resting on us in our lives? And we talked about the idea that it comes by living the way that Noah lived. Living in obedience, doing what God says to do, and living by faith. Believing God in spite of the circumstances around us. And, and that's a powerful thought. That we can have God's blessing, God's favor on us by, uh, by living the way that God asks us to live. Well, this morning I want to talk... Not so much about uh, who Noah was, but what he did. But before we talk about what Noah did, I want to talk a little bit about what God did. Can we talk about that? I mean, am I the only one that's a, the least little bit disturbed by the thought of the God that I serve wiping out all of humanity with a flood? I mean, on some level, that has to get into your, your spirit and say, God, why? How could you do something like that? I mean, that seems so destructive. Let's look at Genesis 6, 5. We read it last week, but let's just remind ourselves of, of where we are. The Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on the earth, and that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. We, we never want to make some judgment on, especially a judgment on God, but on anyone else without understanding their context first. And then even then, we may not be able to make a judgment. And especially in the case of God, because God knows so much more than we know. And he sees so much more than we see. But we understand in this passage that, that the climate, the spiritual climate of the time was, was terrible. Every inclination of every thought of every human was only bad all the time. That is a devastating remark on humanity. We need to understand before we go any further that this is the climate that we're talking about. Total depravity. We think things are bad today. We think that we've got it bad in, in our country because uh, it seems like our moral climate has been in decline for some time now. And it has been. And, there, and it is getting worse in our country. But it's not anything like what it was like in Noah's day. Imagine waking up in the morning and there's nobody righteous anywhere on the earth. Can you imagine what life would be like in a world like that? What if nobody obeyed the laws? Today, at least you can count on most people to be obedient to what the laws are. But that was a day and time when nobody obeyed the laws. How could we function as a society if nobody cared for anybody else and if nobody obeyed the laws that existed? You have to think that way in order to understand the extreme position that God took. Let's go ahead and read, at, uh, read verses 6 and 7. The Lord regretted that he had made human beings on the earth and his heart was deeply troubled. Now last week I talked to you a little bit about this idea that God regretted that he made mankind. Uh, sometimes you and I can go to a store and we can kind of regret that those are our children. You understand what I'm saying? I mean the way they're behaving we say, well boy I wish that wasn't my kid. <laughs> Have you ever uh, cooked something that you wished you had never cooked it? 
and it's so bad and so ruined that your only, your only hope for that dish is just throw it away. It, no more salt, no more pepper. I mean, there's nothing that can fix it. You can't do anything with it. It's totally ruined. It's devastated. Just what? Throw it away. Get rid of it. And I imagine some of you, like myself, have thrown dishes away that you've cooked. <laughs> now that's not really a fair comparison to the idea of a whole world becoming corrupted. It was beyond redemption. Humanity was beyond fixing. It was so bad that it could not be repaired. And what does the Bible say? That it, it broke God's heart. To the point that he wished he had never made humanity. Wow. It must have been extremely bad. So the Lord said, I will wipe from the face of the earth the human race I have created. And with them the animals, the birds and the creatures that move along the ground. For I regret that I have made them. God is going to wipe out the world. That word, wipe, it refers to the idea of, of scrubbing something with water and wiping it clean. Uh, sometimes the Jews did this. They would write down something and then they would take it to a, the river and wipe it. It was a ritual. Someone's uncleanness or whatever. And then they would wash it away. Wipe it off. Isn't it interesting that God uses this terminology, this phrase, the idea of something being washed with water to get rid of the impurity, to clean it off, to wipe it off. He's talking about the earth. It is covered in the corruption of humanity, evil humanity that has violated God's covenant, God's, God's commands and God's directives to the point that the only remedy, the only remedy is for God to wipe it with water to wash it completely and remove the impurity from the earth. That's the extreme measure that God has to take, this idea of wiping it. it. It sounds cruel, it sounds awful, it sounds horrible that God would take that kind of measure. But you have to think for a minute. Again, go back to this idea of what would it be like to live in a society where everybody was wicked? What about the injustices that were done to people every day you think the atrocities that we see in our world are bad think back to things that we've seen happen in our nation think about things we've seen around the world even today uh, this morning on the news I saw uh, the Syrian government is is battling rebels and and they went through an execution style um, killed uh, hundreds of people I mean we see terrible atrocities going on but what if every person was wicked God was being merciful to future generations that would have been born into a society like that. It's better not to be born into society that is totally depraved than to be born. I mean, that's just a, I mean, it's an extreme thought, but that's where we are. And so God, uh, God knew that the only solution was to wipe the earth of this complete cruelty and start it over. And do it and, and have it go right. I mean, from the time of Adam and Eve, people, uh, from the first time when, when Abel, when Cain killed Abel, sin had, ex had just increased and increased and increased to the point where here we are now, the world is totally filled with wickedness. But never forget that while God had to take this extreme measure, the scripture says his heart was deeply troubled. This was something that hurt God on the inside. God is not a cruel, vindictive dictator who looks down, waiting to find somebody who messed up so that he can take out his vengeance and just, justice on them. That is not the kind of God we serve. When God looks at people who sin, his heart breaks. He weeps on the inside when we sin. He, he does not lash out at us in anger. In wrath, his first reaction is pain and hurt. The Bible says he was deeply troubled in his heart. And, and, and this is not the only place where you see this kind of reaction from God. You could go to many scriptures. For example, let's just go to Psalm 81. This is one example of, of God's response, his broken heart response to our sin. 
Psalm 81.10, I am the Lord your God who brought you up out of Egypt. He's speaking, of course, to the nation of Israel. Open wide your mouth and I will fill it. But my people would not listen to me. Israel would not submit to me. So I gave them over to their stubborn hearts to follow their own devices. God calls to us and says, follow me, listen to me. I want to fill you with good things. If you will only open your hands. He says to Israel, open your mouth and I will fill it with good things. Just receive it. That's all you have to do. Just receive it. And yet we close our, our hands and make fists. And we close our mouths to God. And we say, I don't want what you have to give me. It's our own rebellion and our own stubbornness that keeps us from receiving the blessings that God wants to give us. And so what did God do to Israel? He said, fine. I tried to bless you. I tried to give you good things. But you closed your fist to me. You closed your mouth. You turned your back. And so God let them go their own direction. That's what it says. He gave them over to their own stubborn hearts. I don't want God to give me over to my own stubborn heart. But you know what? God doesn't force us to do right. He doesn't. He, he offers us blessings. He offers us hope. But if we refuse to follow him, he will let us go our own way. He will let you do whatever you want to do. Verse 13, if my people would only listen to me, if Israel would only follow my ways, how quickly I would subdue their enemies and turn my hand against their foes. God is more anxious to bless you than he is to punish you. That's the, that's the God we serve. He wants more than anything to bless you. He does not want to punish you. Some of you uh, have heard that phrase, when a parent goes to discipline a child, this hurts me more than it hurts you, and you never believed it as a child. But a parent wants to bless their kids. They don't want to hurt them. They don't want to punish them. They want to praise them. Punishment only comes because we bring it on ourselves. Jesus said something similar. He was looking out over the city of Jerusalem. Matthew 23, verse 37. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you were not willing. So Jesus, looking out over the city of Jerusalem, he says, the blessings of God would have rushed to your side, but you refused. God wants to bless us today. You know, as we think about this idea that God was going to flood the earth, we cannot think about that without also understanding that God was merciful to them. Because if you go back uh, to verse 3, it says this in Genesis chapter 6, verse 3. Then the Lord said, My spirit will not contend with humans forever, for they are mortal. Their days will be 120 years. Most scholars and myself agree that this refers to the idea that God is granting 120 years for mankind to straighten up and repent and get their act right. 120 years. Not 120 days. Not 120 weeks. 120 years years to change God is long suffering God is long suffering God is extremely patient how many of you would be patient enough to wait 120 years for somebody to start acting right <laughs> no you're going to give them the count to three one two three <laughs> that's it that's all our children ever got three and you're done <laughs> But God says, I'll give you 120 years to change. That's a merciful God. You understand that God was granting mercy. And, and the same idea that about God wiping humanity from the face of the earth, that same concept is used to talk about what God does with our sins. <laughs> yeah, he wipes away our sins. The same God who wiped away sinners in the flood wipes away sin from our heart. 
So this is a God who loves us. This is a God who's merciful. This is a God who is willing to grant forgiveness. He would much rather grant forgiveness than to grant destruction. Isaiah 43, 25 says, I, even I, am he who blots out. That's that word, wipe. He blots it out. I blot out transgressions for my own sake and remembers your sins no more. <laughs> the same God who wiped the earth wants to wipe our hearts clean of sin. Isaiah 44, 22. I have swept away your offenses like a cloud. Again, that's that concept of wiping away. I've swept away your offenses like a cloud. Your sins, like the morning mist, return to me for I have redeemed you. This is the voice of God to us. We, we, we want to say the voice of God is I'm going to wipe humanity off the face of the earth. But what we need to hear is I am a God who says I give you 120 years to change. I am the God who says... Come to me for I have redeemed you. I will wipe away your sins and remember them no more. That's the voice we need to remember from the Lord our God. Our God loves us. Does God judge? Yes. But he also forgives. Does God punish? Yes. But he also pardons. I'm so thankful we serve a God who's filled with love and compassion. His mercies are never ending. They're new every day. And His love never fails. This is the kind of God that we serve. But we're talking about a context in which every person on the earth had turned their back against God, refused to follow Him, refused to obey, and had turned so that every inclination of every thought was only wicked all the time. And yet in the context of all of that, we go down to verse 8 and it says this in Genesis 6, but Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. God spoke to Noah and he chose him to build an ark and save the world. Man, so let's talk about what Noah did. I want you to understand this first of all. Noah is not the instrument of God's wrath. He is the instrument of God's grace. Think about that. Noah didn't bring the flood. We, we call them the, it's the Noah's flood. But Noah did not flood the earth. God brought flood as a punishment for sin. What Noah did was build an ark to save Noah was an instrument of God's grace, not an instrument of God's wrath. So Noah was told to build an ark. He said, God said to him, I want you to build an ark. And you're going to put two of every animal in the ark. And you and your family will be saved because I'm going to flood the earth. So eight human beings and all the animals of the earth were to be saved in this ark. Now next week... The message is called Surviving the Storm. And I'm going to talk to you about sometimes we get caught up in storms in life. Sometimes we go through very, very difficult times. But I want you to know that the same God who caused the flood also told Noah to build an ark. The same Jesus who told his disciples to get into a boat and go to the other side and a storm came up is the same Jesus who spoke and calmed the storms. And so sometimes we go through storms in life, but we always need to remember that God never leaves us. He's always with us, just like we sang about this morning, and that he will be with us even in the storms. So that's next week. We're going to talk about surviving the storm. How do we get through the storm? What do you think Noah did? You think maybe he found some hidden location kind of like an Area 51 project, secret project. And so he's, he's back behind this mountain building this ark so that nobody knows where he is, nobody knows what's going on. And every day he takes, you know, a commute back to this uh, Area 51 site and he's, he's working in secret and, you know, no, uh-uh. I think Noah built the thing right where he lived. I mean, that was his lifelong project, just about. And so every day for uh, who, however many years it took, it, maybe it took him 100, 120 years, who knows. He's out there building this ark. Every day, every day, every day, building this ark. 
And can you imagine the people that came by to see him? Hey Noah, what you got going there? <laughs> Never seen anything like that. It's quite a massive structure you've got. What, what you building? I'm building an ark. An ark? What, what do you mean an ark? Well, God's going to flood the earth. And this ark is designed to preserve life. So if you want to be saved, all you have to do is repent of your sin. The door is huge. You can just come on in the ark with us and God will save you. Do you know, uh, we don't know how many times Noah made that appeal to people who came by to see him. But we do know this, everyone turned him down. <laughs> everyone turned him down. Noah went to every, uh, every person that Noah spoke to, turned him down. No thanks, I don't believe it. It's not going to happen. You've been working on this for 75 years. Everyone's been talking about it. Nothing's going to happen. You're a crazy old man. Hmm. Sometimes it feels like that in America in ministry. <laughs> Sometimes it feels like you try and you try to share your faith and nobody responds. But ministry in America is nothing like ministry in Noah's day. I mean, he went 120 years and nobody repented. Not one soul. I mean, we, we don't have a record like that in America. There are people getting saved in this country every day. Every day people are getting saved across America. Now that's a wonderful thing to think about. But in Noah's day, not one person got saved in 120 years. What does the Bible tell us about him? 2 Peter 2, 5. Now we're in the New Testament. Uh, Peter's talking about Noah. And he, and he says this. And God did not spare the ancient world except for Noah and the seven others in his family. Noah warned the world of God's righteous judgment. So God protected Noah when he destroyed the world of ungodly people with a vast flood. Noah warned the world. Noah preached and he said, please repent. I, why do you think I'm building this ark to waste my time? No, because God told me to do it. He's going to send a flood. There will be uh, a terrible punishment for sin. You must repent. I can't imagine the urgency that must have been in Noah's voice toward those who came by to see him as he warned them about God's judgment. We have no idea. None of that is recorded. In fact, Noah's... Uh, the words of Noah are not recorded until much later in his story. It's only the words of God that we hear. Noah built an ark and here's how to do it. In the Old Testament, God provided a way of escape from destruction through an ark, a boat. Today, God has also provided a way of escape from destruction. But it's not through a boat, it's through a person. It's through Jesus what Jesus has done on the cross spares us. It saves us from the destruction that is to come if we don't give our hearts to him. God does not want one single person to end up in eternal damnation. But God wants every person to be saved. Without exception. Every person. God loves everyone on the earth. In Peter's first letter... He was talking about the salvation that Jesus provides. And, and he, again, he talks about Noah. Uh, so he's talking about Jesus um, proclaiming his, his victorious resurrection. And, and let's just take a part of that scripture. 1 Peter 3, 19 and 20 says, So he went and preached to the spirits in prison, those who disobeyed God long ago, when God waited patiently while Noah was building his boat. Only eight people were saved from drowning in that terrible flood. Wow. God waited what? Patiently. For 120 years while Noah built an ark and warned the people, God waited patiently and the only ones who got saved were who? Noah and his family. How would you like to have a ministry where your only congregation is your family? <laughs> your wife and kids. That's it. <laughs> Nobody else gets saved. <laughs> Nobody else believes you. Nobody else will listen. Now there's some, 
strange thoughts in this, um, this verse that's a little bit complicated. And, and we don't have time this morning to get into it. But I will get into that on Wednesday night. If you come back Wednesday night, I'll talk about what does it mean where it says, so he went and preached to the spirits in prison. We'll talk about that on Wednesday night. Uh, so come back and we're also going to pray for our community as well. Uh, and of course that is contingent upon whether or not we actually get a flood here. Depending on what the hurricane does. Okay, but look at the next verse, verse 21. It says, and this water symbolizes, what water? The water of the flood. And this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also. Not the removal of dirt from the, the body, but the pledge of a clear conscience toward God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The water that flooded the earth was God's instrument of judgment. But now it symbolizes a different kind of water, a water of baptism. The water today symbolizes a, a refreshing, a cleansing. Now we know that baptism doesn't save us, but baptism symbolizes our salvation. It symbolizes what Jesus did. He, he died on the cross, was buried, and rose again to new life. And when we are baptized in water, we symbolize this very act of death, burial, and resurrection. That's what baptism symbolizes. So the water that once destroyed now saves. The water that once brought judgment brings salvation. Now we have a symbol of hope. A symbol of hope. If only we had some way to take that symbol of hope to the community and show them that Jesus cares. Man, if only we had, maybe we'll come up with something. So Jesus' resurrection gives us new life. And the, and the water that destroyed now is a symbol of the salvation that comes through Jesus. Think about what we've talked about. God's heart breaks when the world sins. God would rather extend mercy than judgment. And God instructed Noah to provide a way of salvation for his family and anybody who would believe and repent. Let's go back one more time to the idea of God's mercy and compassion. But I don't want us to look at it back in the Old Testament. Although it's there and we saw it. We've already looked at it. Let's fast forward to the New Testament. And let's see it from Jesus' perspective. Mark 6, 34 says this. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had, say that word with me, compassion. Say it again, compassion. He had compassion on them. Because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So we began teaching them many things. They were like sheep with no shepherd. They were lost. They were vulnerable. And when Jesus sees lost and vulnerable people, what does he do? He doesn't laugh at them. He doesn't scorn them. He weeps for them. The Bible says he had compassion on them. I want us to hear the heartbeat of God this morning as he weeps for the lost. I want us to feel the rain of his love and the wind of his spirit. I want God's heartbeat to throb in us. As God sees the broken, the hurting, the lost, may our hearts beat in sync with His. May we feel His compassion. May we feel the hurt in His heart. May we weep the tears that God weeps over lost, hurting people. Let's look at another story that Jesus told. Matthew 18, 12. What do you think? 
If a man owns a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away, will he not leave the ninety-nine on the hills and go to look for the one that wandered off? And if he finds it, truly I tell you, he is happier about that one sheep than about the ninety-nine that did not wander off. In the same way, your Father in heaven is not willing that any of these little ones should perish. God is not willing that any people perish. For God so loved 78.645% of the world. No. For God so loved the world. Everybody in the world. God loves everybody. You've got to be joking me. How could he possibly? But he does. He loves everyone. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. That whoever believes in him should not, what? Perish. He doesn't want to wipe us off the face of the earth. He wants to wipe away our sins. Our time is short. I believe that it's time for us to look for those lost sheep that are out there wandering around lost, vulnerable, broken, bruised, hurt, lonely, suffering. What do they need? Well, they need Jesus. They need a shepherd. They need someone to care for them. But you see, God has sent us to tell them that. He's given us the responsibility just like he gave Noah the responsibility in his day to share with the world that God loves. He's given us the responsibility to share that love today in this world. What is your world? What is your world? You know, that used to frighten me, that idea of saving the world. <laughs> I mean, it's a big world. It's seven billion people. How can I save the world? I can't. But it all made sense to me one time years ago when one of our former associate pastors, Keith Culver, preached a sermon and he said, what about your world? Don't concentrate on the whole world. Concentrate on your world. Because your world is reachable. You may not be able to reach the people in Bangladesh and Moscow and in Dublin, but you can reach the people in Birmingham, Alabama. You can reach the people in your neighborhood. You can reach the people in your workplace. You can reach the people in your school. You can reach the people in your world. And God has called you to be a light in your world. Wherever you are, that's your world around you. And you can reach that. You can do something about that. I believe. I believe that our time is short. What can we do? If only there was something we could do to tell people about Jesus. And to share his love and compassion. His heart of care and hope. Oh, if only we could just give hope. I believe we can. Hmm. Matthew 25, 35 through 36, no, all the way through 41, but let's start with verses 35 and 36. For I was hungry, and you fed me. I was thirsty. And you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me into your home. I was naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you cared for me. I was in prison and you visited me. Verse 37, then they, these righteous ones will reply, Lord, when did we ever see you hungry and feed you? Or thirsty and give you something to drink? Or a stranger and show you hospitality? Or naked and give you clothing? And when did we ever see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will say, verse 40, I tell you the truth, when you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, 
You are doing it to me. You are doing it to me. It seems so simple, doesn't it? I mean, when you read it like that, give a hungry person food. Give a thirsty person something to drink. Care for someone who's sick. Visit someone who's in the hospital. I mean, isn't that really very simplistic? I mean, shouldn't it be more complicated than that? Shouldn't we have to get a degree in theology and understand the ramifications of salvation through the history of mankind? Shouldn't we be able to expound on the mercies of God? I think maybe Jesus was saying it's simple. God has blessed you. God has extended compassion and favor and grace to your life. Now take that favor and grace and extend it to someone else in the form of doing something practical. Extend compassion to somebody else. <laughs> Isn't it interesting that our, our cards that we use for doing acts of service, they say acts of random kindness on the front. Big capital letters, A R. K. Ark. Ark. <laughs> Why, there's an ark behind me. <laughs> and it's made not of gopher wood, but it is made of bottles of water. I believe that we can take these bottles of water and we can extend a little bit of compassion to somebody else and say, hey, you know what? We just want to give you a, a cool, cool bottle of water. I know it's hot out here. Here you go. We just want you to know God loves you. That's it. How simple is that? I mean, it's so utterly simple. And yet, it can have such a profound impact. You say, Pastor, that's just way too easy. That's just, there's, there's no way this is going to make a difference. I believe it will. I believe it will make a difference. One of the reasons I believe it will make a difference is because I believe God has spoken to Pastor Fabricio and myself. We work together so much. Uh, praying together and, and, and brainstorming together and I believe that the Holy Spirit is definitely giving a, given us vision in this area that this is what we need to do you say oh what's going to happen are we going to have like 200 people in our church the next Sunday no it's not about that you don't understand this is about us being obedient Noah built the ark and nobody came we may give out a thousand bottles of water and nobody might come to our church, but it doesn't matter. What matters is that you and I take the compassion and love of God and we give it to somebody else. We don't know what will happen with the seed that we plant. Maybe somebody will come to our church. I hope they do. But more important is that you and I are obedient, that we hear the heartbeat of God for other people, that we develop some love, some compassion for somebody else. That we get up and do something about it. Mark 9.41 says this. If anyone gives you even a cup of water because you belong to the Messiah, I tell you the truth, that person will surely be rewarded. So here's our plan. Next Saturday, meet here, 10 o'clock in the morning. Go ahead and show that graphic I've got. Give water, give hope. Bring with you a cooler if you have one. If you don't have one, don't worry about it. We'll, uh, I think if everybody brings a cooler that has one, we'll have plenty of coolers. Bring a bag of ice because we want to give out cold water, not hot water. And uh, bring $10 for a t-shirt. Kid sizes, we're going to give kids their t-shirts free. But adult size t-shirts are just $10 a piece. And on the front of the t-shirt, it says, Hope Service Team. Uh, they're blue t-shirts, by the way, in case you want to know, because I know some of you ladies care about matching colors. I don't care, <laughs> but I know ladies do care. So they're blue t-shirts with white writing, Hope Service Team. And then on the back of it, it says Serving Hope. And it has our website on it. And so all of us will be going around with these matching shirts. We'll go to designated spots in our community. We'll hand out uh, cups of cold water. We'll also give out... Um, these little flyers for back to school blitz and a little arc card that says somebody at Horizon Church cares about you. <laughs> it's that simple. It's that simple. I want you to be on board because a simple act of random kindness is just one step in changing the world. 
I believe we can do it with God's help.